In this video, I review Kraken Studios' Fantasy Dungeon Kickstarter. Before we get into today's video, just want to congratulate all of the Patreon supporters who received the GGGG for last month. Each month, Bob the Beholder picks some of my Patreon supporters to receive gratitude gifts. And for last month, there was so many. So here is the list of folks who Bob the Beholder picked in order to receive some awesome gratitude gifts, including a lot of Kickstarter pledges, as well as terrain from Dungeons and Lasers and various other prizes. Thanks so much to all of my Patreon supporters. You make this channel what it is. And for this month of June of 2021, we have a number of GGGGs. So go on over to my Patreon page to see what those are. Included in this month will be two pledges for this Kickstarter you'll be chosen at the end of the month and will be included when it's time to deliver these files. Before we move ahead with the video, I just need to make a couple of corrections. And I normally don't do this. I normally make any corrections in the comments below, but I feel like Kraken Studios made some awesome responses due to my video, but I really wanted to reward companies that are responsive like this. So I'm gonna pop up in a couple of places throughout this video where there are corrections. I did want to encourage you to go check out the Kickstarter page because there are tons of other files that I wasn't able to print out and they have amazing variety. I especially love the bridge piece that I didn't have time to print out. So make sure you check out their website to see the amazing variety of tiles that are found there. As well as all of the miniatures, I was sad that I didn't have time to print out any of the miniatures, but those STL files look fantastic for those minis that will fit in almost any fantasy setting. At the end of the video, I do have a painting tutorial, so go ahead and use the timeline below in order to skip ahead if you need that. By the time I post this video, we will have about a week left of the Kickstarter, so make sure to jump in on that if you are interested. I first heard about Kraken Studios when I was doing a Google search because I wanted to create a 3D printed pitch for my Blitz Bowl game. And one of their first Kickstarters was creating 3D printed tiles for Blood Bowl as well as Blitz Bowl. And I'm in the process of printing all of those out and will come up with a review video of that. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and that should be coming up pretty soon. They also make some sci-fi train, but more recently they have come out with this current Kickstarter that is their fantasy dungeon set. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you know that I really have settled in on Dragon's Rest system in creating not only a hero quest board, but a bunch of various dungeon crawl boards. I still like that system a lot. And in terms of granularity, I still think that tile set is still one of the best. But the reason why I jumped in on this Kickstarter is because I think this set actually is a little bit more easier to use and practical for certain kinds of games where you are laying down tiles that are specifically these sizes. So Kraken Studios, I know created this board mimicking the tile set that you're gonna find in the first edition of Warhammer Quest. So this is gonna work well for that game as well as other tile laying games like Advanced Hero Quest and as well some of the newer Warhammer Quest series like Silver Tower and Cursed City that have come out. Now this tile system really only works where you're not having rooms right next to each other. And so like Warhammer Quest where you're laying down halls and interspersed with room tiles and things like that, this is gonna actually work best for those game systems. And my intention is to actually use this tile set for Dungeoneer, a recently published RPG that just came out. Again, I'm gonna be doing a review of that in the future, so make sure you're subscribed if you're interested in hearing about Dungeoneer. But in that gaming system, it has very similar tiles to Warhammer Quest, and so I was looking for 
a system that more easily stores and I can pull out and lay down more quickly than my current Dragon's Rest tiles. And one of the things that I really like about this system is the wall elements are sparse and selective in terms of where you can put them. Now, all of these can be printed out without any of the walls at all. So they come with versions that don't have these wall inserts. But of course, I wanted a little bit of 3D element in it. So I printed the versions with sort of the wall elements, terrain elements that are around it. And I chose not to glue them down because I do want to be able to store these flat on top of one another in a box because storage for me is an issue right now. So this is sort of a perfect system where I feel like it has just the right number of walls where you just get a sense of there being a 3D element to these rather than just flat tiles, but not so much that it's a hassle to be able to put away and store because these uh, after I remove the wall elements will stack really neatly right on top of each other as well I don't feel like I need to print out a lot because in a lot of these dungeon crawls You don't have to keep the entire board laid out I feel like once I explore a room and move on I don't really ever return back to the rooms So it can sort of be this chain system where I'm just taking pieces off of the areas that I've already explored and lay them down ahead so that should work out really well. Also, this doesn't have a particular clip system like open lock or anything like that. And that was intentional because they wanted to have the greatest amount of flexibility in order to be able to connect these pieces wherever you need them to be. So they have just these little really simple flat pieces that act as a peg. And realistically, you can't really move an entire dungeon once you've assembled it. These pegs don't actually hold it strong enough where you're able to move things around. But again, like I said, since I'm only going to be having about this many tiles out at once, I don't think that's a big deal. And you can constantly be moving and shifting your dungeon tiles as you're moving forward. Also, all of the doors are clipping on at the edge of each of the dungeon tiles and so that makes it pretty easy. Now one thing I do wish that they had is that these doors are not held in place at all. They, they're sort of sticking in there just through friction uh, and it's okay once the door is open you just remove it like this um, signifying that the door is open but I wish that they did have doors that actually opened and closed and again Dragon's Rest their doors print all in, as one piece and you snap it open to be able to make it uh, able to move on hinges. So Kraken Studios, if you're able to do that, that would be awesome. It isn't a huge pain actually to uh, place or remove these doors as is. Uh, I, think, I think that's fine, but uh, that's just something on my wish list. Also, the other thing that I want to tell you is Kraken Studios has made these files so that they're meant to be printed on edge rather than flat. And it makes a huge difference. I typically, print all of my terrain at 0.2 millimeter height. And I did that with this. And you can tell here uh, that there is a good amount of detail that is preserved when you print on edge. You can still see the print lines, especially when you're dry brushing like I did. But the amount of details that you're getting from it, I think it, it's good and looks fantastic. Now compare it to the stairwell piece because I had to print this flat you can really tell all of these sort of contour lines that you're getting when you print these pieces flat. I don't think it looks terrible if this is sort of, you know, printing them flat is your only way of being able to print these pieces. Uh, I think it looks fine, but you're gonna get these contour edges, especially if you're dry brushing. That's just gonna be one of the disadvantages of printing these flat. Now, you do add the amount of print time when you are printing these vertically rather than horizontally. Um, I don't really care that much because I think just the uh, visual results is worth spending that extra time printing these upright. Also, the other thing that I want to tell you is that these files are optimized more for a resin printer than they are for an FDM printer. I haven't tried printing any of these pieces and typically I don't print terrain on my resin printer. And because of that, these pieces are going to be sized for the smaller build plate of a resin printer. That's not gonna be a problem. I can just stack a bunch of these and print them all at once on my FDM printer. But you'll notice that all of the files are a little bit limited to these four block wide pieces. 
and Kraken Studios with any rooms that are bigger than that, they cut them in half so that you will need to glue those pieces later on. Also, because they're optimized for the resin printer, I have found that I need to be mindful of when I print these pieces in terms of supports, creating supports, and Kraken Studios does a good job sending instructions on how to print these both on a resin printer or an FDM printer. So they walk you through that process of how to set up these files. One of the things I did notice though, when I stood these up on end uh, for my in my slicer, just make sure that after you slice your files, scroll all the way down in the preview mode to make sure that this base is contacting your build plate because sometimes there's an artifact or a little piece that pushes the actual file above the build plate and you won't notice that and you'll have a failed print if that's the case. So always check your files in preview mode in your slicer before printing. I think that's just a wise thing to do to make sure all the files are going to have success in printing. Also because I printed these off of my Prusa printers, I didn't use Cura but instead use Prusa slicer. The supports for that is a little bit different and I use auto, auto supports. And I did use full supports for all of the archways as well as this stairwell piece which comes in two pieces. You can print as one piece but I printed as two pieces and I use auto supports particularly for this piece with these doors. And then finally, and I do know that this is one of their social stretch goals but I think this is super important because although all of the files that are currently uh, unlocked and on the Kickstarter fit the tiles from Warhammer Quest, for my purposes with Dungeoneer, I really need six by six rooms, six square by six square, and there is no option for that right now. So please Kraken Studios, if for whatever reason that social stretch goal isn't opened up in the final days of the campaign, please make that available for purchase later on because otherwise I really won't be able to use this system Actually, this is where Kraken Games responded right away when they saw my video. They said that they're going to unlock this feature right now. So they're not waiting for it to be a stretch goal because it is so key. And for me, the most important aspect to be able to use this set for any of the games that I have is to be able to customize the pieces. So thank you so much Kraken Studios for opening that up. It actually makes the versatility and usefulness of this set a hundred times better and so thank you so much for responding in that way. Now the advantage to them creating all these pieces together is they have some awesome elements that are on there like debris and skulls and things like that. They can design it all together as one piece. And, and I know you won't be able to do that or have you know all of the variety of the cracked pieces and whatnot when you create a single STL file. So other than those things, I do think that this is a good option specifically for those games. In terms of granularity and in terms of being able to reproduce the Hero Quest board, this is not the system for you. Stick with Dragon's Rest, still the most uh, customizable set that you're gonna be able to own particularly because you can print out single squares, which most dungeon sets only uh, allow you to print out four by four squares. This set really is designed for games that I've mentioned before. And as long as you know that, this is a great set. And not only do they have this dungeon set, actually this isn't true, Kraken Studios did send me an image of how you can use these tiles for Hero Quest and the links in the descriptions below if you want to take a closer look at this image but it shows how you can use these files to emulate more dynamically exposing the different hallways and all of the rooms that are in the original Hero Quest board. It isn't an exact replication and they do have to fudge a little bit by the hallways being a little bit longer than what's in the original board but I do think it's a pretty close approximation. And not only do they have this dungeon set, but they have, but they also have a cave set and a hell set, as well as some miniatures, uh, STL files that look really good. I haven't printed any of those out, but those look great as well. And at about $60 US, that's a great deal because you're getting all of those files. That's the all in is the $60 pledge. So make sure you check out links in the descriptions below for everything. Also check out 
Kraken Studios Facebook page and their website because right now during the campaign you get 20% off everything in their web store and I wish I would have gotten the Blitz Bowl pitch finished and the video in time so that you could check that out as well. But take advantage of the 20% off. If you're interested in creating a pitch, grab that pitch off of their website. At least grab those files because that video I will be uploading in the next couple of weeks. And it is going to look awesome too. So Kraken Studios does a great job. If you're interested, make sure to take advantage of that 20% off before June 19th. If you're interested, stick around for the painting tutorial. Again, make sure to like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon page to see what the GGGG is for this month. Otherwise, happy printing, happy gaming. We'll see you next time. All right, so I'm going to make my dungeon gray. And for my spray primer, I usually use this Ultra Matte Slate Gray. If you don't have this brand or this color, go ahead and pick the darkest gray that you can. Alternative that I've used in the past is Krylon's Chalky Finish Anvil Gray. Although this is more expensive here in the United States, this is about six or seven dollars, whereas I can get this for four. So this is a lot cheaper and more economical. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this and spray all of the dungeon pieces that are gonna be stone. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and spray with all of the walls on there. And I usually just go and hit all of the pieces from one angle and then just rotate around on each side. Now if you want a darker dungeon, you can go ahead and do it in black, prime everything black, but I think the contrast is a little bit high with the black and that's why I'm doing dark gray here. All right, so once all the gray is done, I'm gonna go ahead and grab some of Krylon Camouflage Brown. And again, if you don't have this, you can grab any dark uh, brown that you have as a base. And we're gonna go ahead and do all of the wooden parts. And so I'm gonna grab some of the pieces, have wood like this. Now there is a piece that is a combination of stone and wood and typically I go ahead and just prime this gray like I did here and then I'm going to go back and uh, paint this uh, by brush with a dark brown. So we'll go ahead and set that aside but for this piece that is almost all wood I am going to go ahead and spray that. So now what I have is craft paint so I use Americana and use some zinc and some slate gray. What I'm gonna do is mix these two because this is too dark and this is too light. So I'm trying to get something in between. I'm using a stiff hog's hair brush, my biggest one, and just going to mix about half-half. Doesn't really matter, it doesn't have to be perfect, but just trying to get a medium kind of gray. There might be a gray that's perfect that is bottled, but um, since I buy my craft paints from Hobby Lobby or from Michaels, uh, I haven't found one that matches this color that I'm really looking for. Uh, you don't want it to be too wet, so just get it to about this consistency. And then what you're gonna do is just grab these parts and just paint over like this. And there's quite a bit of paint on here so uh, maybe take a little bit of it off by rubbing it onto a napkin. And this is sort of the effect that you're going for. A little bit on the light side, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter too much. And then also you want to do the floors as well. And with this initial gray, I'm going to go from all directions, not just one direction, and hitting up a good number of the edges and highlighting so it just makes the details pop out some. Just like so. And when you can, rub with the print lines as you can see here because that way you don't emphasize it as much but this looks pretty good. 
So this is sort of the effect that you want. We're still gonna do another layer of dry brushing, so just keep that in mind. This is the initial coat. So do that for all of your stone pieces. Whatever is stone, this is what you wanna do with it. Now I'm gonna take some honey brown, but you can take any accents color that you want. Sometimes I use like burnt orange or other colors. Um, no particular reason that I'm using this color, but just any little accent color is fine. And I'm gonna grab my sable brush and just wet it down and just randomly paint up some bricks. So this just gives a little bit of variation. And as you can see, I'm not super careful about it, just um, coloring the thing. Doesn't have to be perfect. And then, oh, I wanted to point out, um, I printed this without supports, and as you can see, there's a little bit of stringing that's happening on the underneath parts. Um, and I wanted to see if I could actually, and this is a sample piece that everyone can print off. And I'll go through, probably should have done it before I started painting, but I'll go through and just clip those off with um, my clippers, but pretty much just randomly pick some bricks and just paint them up like this. And you can sort of choose how frequently you want. Um, I'm only going to do a few of them, not too many. And like I mentioned before, in some of my other painting tutorials or videos, you will see that I actually choose more than one accent color. And it is entirely up to you how much you want to provide different colors throughout your dungeon. But uh, not too hard, just this is good enough for me. And then do the other side here. like so and that's pretty much it that's about the frequency that I'm looking for um, I'm actually not going to do that uh, like taking out a whole block because uh, I'm going to do a little bit of darker brown here for the dirt but uh, only doing this for the walls you know what after looking at it I am going to go ahead and do some of these border stones not the main stones here, squares here, but just on the edges. And I think that'll look fine doing some of these. All right, so now I'm gonna use slate gray, which was what we mixed earlier, but this time not mixing it because I want the lighter gray color. And again, using a horsehair brush. The reason why I use a horsehair brush is because when the brush is stiff, it will only brush on the paint on the very top raised edges and so it's easier to do dry brushing. And here you'll notice I have less on my brush than I did the medium gray. And so just take this and this time I'm being more sparse with it, only hitting the highlights rather than the broad strokes that I was doing. And make sure you get these um, highlight colors as well because it's gonna tie those colors together. So it's super subtle what you're doing with this dry brush layer, but that's pretty much what you're going for. Very light, nothing dramatic. Make sure you don't have too much on your brush or else you'll ruin the effect. And with the walls, I actually drag it down and I don't put a lot on the bottom, towards the bottom and keep that actually a little bit darker than the top part. And that's pretty much it. Now we're gonna add some brown and I use Burnt Umber from Apple Barrel, which is super cheap. This is one of the darker browns that I found. What we're gonna do is go ahead and put this dark brown sort of wherever there's dirt. So if you see these spots like this, you know, and you can be pretty messy with it and free formed like so, and this is just adding a little bit of color to the whole thing. And it makes the base just have 
somewhat of variety. Obviously this is optional, but I think I think it's worth it because it just breaks up the gray a little bit on the ground and just makes the whole surface or the dungeon seem a little bit more grungy rather than so uniform. And feel free if you want to just add some splashes of this brown, you know, even onto the stones like this and you can again because there's going to be dirt on the ground right so that just offers a little bit of variation so you can do that and then the other spots where you want the dark brown to be is anything that's metal and you might be wondering oh why why not just put silver on top which you absolutely could do but by having brown it just gives it that rusted look and we are going to go over this with silver but before that having a base of dark brown will make it look more rusted and old and then not only on this piece but also you want to make sure you get the chains on this door the uh, metal grate that goes on this door yet but once I do that I'm going to um, actually spray paint that the dark brown that I did all the other doors and then we're going to come back and put silver on top of this. But it just gives it that rusted look, which I think looks more authentic. On the base, there are some chains here. So don't forget to put some of the paint right down here. This is milk chocolate or a just a medium brown. And this is going to go over all of the wood pieces. I'm going to use a smaller brush this time, but still stiff hog's hair brush. And because this wood is so dark, I'm going to need to do two coats of this. And as you notice, I am going across the grain, not with the grain, so that the dark brown remains in the cracks and crevices. And like I mentioned before, I'm going to have to do two coats. So I go at it one direction, then I flip it over like this, and then do it the other direction as well. And again, this helps maintain the um, wood grain, if there is any, because it just prevents the paint from going into the crevices there. So do that for all the wood, including these posts, as well as on here. So this is what it looks like with two coats of the milk chocolate on there. But before we move on to the lighter brown, I am actually going to grab my sable brush and go ahead and on this room tile, there are these um, flower uh, designs on the walls, also on the floors. So what I'm going to do is actually take the same milk chocolate and I'm going to paint in these flower designs, also the ones that are on the floor, because I think I'm going to make them copper. So uh, this just creates a base coat for it. You could just paint copper directly on top of this, but sometimes just having this base coat makes um, any metallics uh, look a little bit better. So again, this is purely optional. In fact, I probably wouldn't even do it if I didn't already have the color out. And then also you're going to find it on the floor right here. We're grabbing some honey brown and this is what we used before to do all of the uh, accent blocks on here. So it's the same thing, grabbing this brush again. And this time just very lightly dry brushing all of the wood. Don't want to put a ton of this on, but just a little bit just to grab 
those highlights off of the edge of the wood like so and you don't want to put a ton on there but that's sort of what you want so here's the difference now I'm just taking some black and we're gonna do all of the parts that are metal and I'm deciding that the border of this is all going to be metal rather than wood. You can choose for it to be wood and um, therefore just paint it brown like the rest of the door but I like just making this part be metal and whereas I could have rusted it out like I did with the other metal parts um, on the terrain uh, I'm just going to make this, uh, because they're doors, these are used and not rusted out. So I'm just going to paint all of this black. And what I'll do is come back and go uh, dry brush it with silver. Just a real light coat of silver. And then on the smaller doors, it is just going to be these bands. And then I'm also going to touch up these um, rivets. You don't have to do that because we're going to put silver on there. But it provides a little bit of shading. This is folk art gunmetal gray, but you can use any silver. I like this because it's a little bit darker, not quite so shiny. Using a smaller brush because I'm going to tap all of these rivets. And then just really briefly going around. So I'm not doing a lot on there, just enough to put some shine on the edges. That's really all I'm doing. And you can use any metallic. You can even leave it black because if you notice sort of when blacksmiths do steel work, it's um, typically, or ironwork, um, the metal is usually black, not silver. But the reason why I put some silver on there is just because it um, just highlights a little bit the metal. But it's sort of up to you how you want to do it. And that, that's pretty much it. Just gives a little bit of shine to it so that it's obviously metal. And that's a nice contrast to the gray is to have uh, a little bit of silver on there. And then with these rusted parts you can grab a bigger brush but I, I'm, I'm still going to do the door so here just put a little bit of silver on not a lot just to give it enough because we want it to be mostly rusty but this just makes it obvious that this is metal but more rusted. Grabbing some avocado because there are some vines throughout some of these pieces. So look there and then also here. Now you could absolutely make these brown but because I have brown in other areas I'm deciding to make my vines this um, avocado green, sort of this olive green color. Just to have a different color to go with all of this. See that's all that needs. You could highlight it, you could lighten it out with some white on this avocado color, but uh, I think just doing one coat here is enough. Here I have some Citadel Hachette copper, but if you have any craft paint that is copper, that's fine. Now I'm taking the spots that I pre-painted before with that brown and just putting some copper on there. 
and because I have the brown on there I don't have to be super detailed I just can throw some on just enough to make it shiny <laughs> 